Welcome to Ed Talks. My name is David Slump. I'm uh, current Board of Governors Teaching Chair at the University of Lethbridge, and it is an uh, honor and pleasure to be here with Dr. Shelley Wismet, uh, who is the 3M Teaching Award winner. Um, the university is extremely proud of your accomplishment, uh, so congratulations for that. I thought maybe we could begin by just talking about um, what, what does the career trajectory of a 3M Teaching Award winner look like? <laughs> Well, it wasn't something that was ever planned or worked <laughs> towards, really. Uh, I've been teaching at the U of L since the early 80s, in mm -hmm. fact. All my life I've worked here. I came for a 10-month term position as a tutorial instructor and in fully intending to go back to Ontario and didn't. Ended up staying, so uh, I taught labs for and tutorials in math for a year, and then I went away and did a master's degree, and then I came back as an instructor in math. Uh, five years of term appointments, eventually got a tenure-track position, and I taught in the math department uh, until about the last six or seven years when I moved to teaching in liberal education. Yeah. So I've kind of been through the ranks, and. Yeah. Uh, taught a wide range of things. One of the things that's been exciting for me at the U of L is the opportunity to teach a lot of different things. So even in math, I actually, at one point, was the only person in the department who'd actually taught math and stats and computer science. Oh, wow. And since then, I've taught in liberal education and women and gender studies, yeah. and uh, I've taught social science courses and humanities courses and science courses and. Yeah, so wow. it's been a lengthy and kind of roundabout path to yeah. where I am now. Yeah. What drives all those shifts? I mean, that's a lot of different areas to have taught in and that. How, how did you find your way moving through all those different departments? Well, and some of it was just happenstance, uh, things, opportunities that came along, being in the right place at the right time. One of the things that that's come out of the 3M process mm -hmm. was having to put together a very lengthy dossier mm -hmm. for which I had to do a fair amount of writing was to look back and try and and identify what are the themes in my teaching and, and trace some of those back. And it was surprising to me um, that many of the themes of my current teaching and interests were there in the beginning just in a different form. So I was trained as a mathematician, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's different for people in the faculty of education, yeah. but for those of us in arts and science, you're trained in a particular discipline. And so I didn't intend to be a teacher. I didn't start out to be a teacher. I trained to be a mathematician. And so the first year of teaching was incredibly scary. Um, my first semester, I taught intro calculus, and I thought we were supposed to get through the whole book, yeah, yeah. and I did. <laughs> and I taught twice as much as I've ever taught since. So in a sense, it felt like being thrown in at the deep end. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I guess that, that I still remember clearly about that was, Mathematicians sort of taught in a standard way. It was the mm -hmm. way I'd always been taught and brought up to think about teaching, was that you went through the content very clearly, and, and I thought I was good at organizing things, mm -hmm. laying it out very logically and explaining it clearly to students, and the students seemed to think so. Um, but I remember very clearly that first midterm, and I thought I'd taught them everything perfectly and they knew nothing. <laughs> and, you know, that was an eye-opener, yeah. and I realized, oh, you can't just go in and say things once perfectly yeah. and they're going to remember it. And so that began basically a 30-year process of, yeah. of trying to figure out how to teach things in a way that people will learn, to go beyond the content. And that's been one of my uh, keen interests all along, yeah. is teaching as a process as opposed to content. Yeah. And when you teach in the sciences, it is very content-oriented, yeah. right? You have a set curriculum you have to get through. Math is so cumulative that you have a responsibility yeah. to your students and the other instructors to get them to the right place. Yeah and trying to keep that content but still 
um, enhance learning in a different way. Yeah. Um, and eventually, I, th I think um, that's what I still focus on today. Yeah. I try to think about the process of learning um, as much as the content of learning. Um, so that was one theme. Yeah. I think I had a different teaching style. Right. Gender was very much a factor back yeah. in the 80s and 90s for women in math. Um, so I had a different teaching style that did maybe focus more on on the learning as opposed to the teaching and seeing students in a wider context yeah. than just repositories of content. Yeah. A story that I tell often is, is how I got into liberal education yeah. had to do with critical thinking. Yeah. And so students would always ask me, well, what can you do with a degree in math? And the yeah. answer is not a lot. <laughs> There is no job labeled mathematician yeah. other than becoming a university professor, yeah. and even then it's 40% of your job, right? Yeah. So what do you do with an undergrad degree in math? And my answer in those days was always to say to students, well, there aren't a lot of direct jobs you're gonna go into, but math yeah. teaches you to think about anything. Yeah. And I really believed that, but I had a chance then in the 90s to work in a, in a precursor of our Lib Ed program, a, an arts and science capstone seminar, and yeah. I thought, this is where I get to put my money where my mouth is, yeah. because do I, in fact, am I, in fact, able yeah. to think about other things than math, yeah. right? I have certain skills of analyzing and, and logical reasoning and putting arguments together, but do they transfer? Yeah. And so I tried it out to see if I could do it and became increasingly interested in yeah. articulating those skills for students. Yeah. And so in some ways it was a natural move then right. into, uh, yeah, into teaching critical thinking yeah. courses. Yeah. And when I moved to Libad, I still, uh, within the LibEd program, I still teach science breadth courses, right. but more um, trying to teach math and science for non-math students and non-science students. So what is it essential for them to know? What do yeah. we want them to know about the process yeah. of you know, evidence-based reasoning yeah. and the scientific method and those kinds of things? So I think those threads were there yeah. back at the beginning. They just took a long time to come. Yeah together in the way they have now. Right. So when you talk about sort of the focus on the process in, in mm -hmm. the teaching versus the focus on the content, well, what, does that, what does that look like for you, this focus on process? What are you trying to instill in students or help them develop? And, and what are the kind of processes that, you, that you've learned to use to do that? Well, it's different in different courses. Yeah. Um, in my math courses, um, one of the courses that I taught for many, many years every semester was our second year math course that was essentially a gateway to the abstract math of upper levels. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a, a course where you teach students the basic vocabulary of advanced math and the basic techniques of doing proofs. Mm -hmm. And it was very frustrating to me um, because originally the way it was taught was you would go in and do math in front of them mm -hmm. and the assumption seemed to be they would learn it by osmosis, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so I started trying to back up from that for students. So this is one of the things to not present a finished product but to talk about how you get to that finished product mm -hmm. and to articulate what's really going on. I would start certain sections of the course by saying, as an analogy, how do you teach someone to drive a car? Mm -hmm. Or how do you teach somebody to write poetry? Mm -hmm. I could stand here and read Shakespeare's sonnets in front of you for a semester, and you might come to appreciate them, but you're not gonna know anything more about how to write a sonnet, right? right? Yeah. And in math, we did that. Right. We would go in and we would show people the finished product. And we mm -hmm. would never mention that it took 100 years for somebody to come <laughs> up with that proof or, you know, at the level we were doing, maybe not quite that mm -hmm. long. But I would talk about the research process, right. and I would say, okay, here's a proof. Here's something we want to prove. You guys work on it. 
rather than me just writing it on the board. Yeah. And, and so I would do a kind of two-week workshop where they would work in groups and I would yeah. go around and look yeah. at things. And that way we could talk about, well, what do you do when you're stuck? Well, there mm -hmm. is an obvious first and second step. Right. The creative part's in the middle. Yeah. So here's the first step, here's uh -huh. the second step, here's working from the bottom up. What do you do in the middle? Here yeah. are the five things you guys tried, different people, yeah. right? Why did this one not work? Yeah. And sort of unpack it right. all. And it yeah. took a bit longer, but I felt it was worth it in yeah. terms of the process, yeah. right? Yeah. So that was kind of the first step for right. me. And I still do that kind of thing. I still try in my LibEd courses, in LibEd 1000, for instance, we have a, a lab once a week that we use for kind of good student skills. Mm -hmm. So we talk about, okay, you have a test coming up. What do you think is gonna be on the test? Mm -hmm. How does a prof make up a test? Mm -hmm. um, I'm really linear and boring and predictable. Mm -hmm. You should know what's <laughs> gonna be on my test, right? And I will do that in my quantitative skills course. Right. Say, well, okay, let's be linear. What was the first topic yeah. we studied? What did we say was the essence of that topic? What do you think the first question is? Yeah. And by the time we've done the first two of those, they start to get the idea, oh, okay, so if there's seven questions, uh -huh. we basically know, and I'm not giving anything away, yeah. but I'm trying to teach them that kind of metacognitive learning right. process. Yeah. Ideally, by third and fourth year, they should be able to do that yeah, for yeah. themselves, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think we take for granted so much of what we do yeah. for us as as researchers and experts, we yeah. forget what it was like to be a first-year student yeah. and how little they know. You yeah. can never um, underestimate, <laughs> I think, the amount yeah. of guidance they need in yeah. those kinds of things, yeah. right? Yeah. So I try to do that very proactively in class, but yeah. I also try by the end of the semester to wean them off of right. me doing it, right? Yeah, they have yeah. to learn to do it for themselves. Yeah, yeah. But I think if you point that out to them, right, and um, whether it's about math tests or, or even writing essays, you know, yeah. that um, I stagger the essay process at the end of the semester over three of these labs. How do you pick a topic? How do you flesh out a topic? Yeah. How do you, you know, you break up the writing into segments. Yeah. Um, don't leave it till the night before and yeah. spend three hours. If you've yeah. got three hours, how do you budget your time? Yeah. All those kinds of things that in content heavy courses there's no room for, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think we for me, at least, it was important to make some time, right. and I didn't find it took away from the content yeah. Yeah. that much that I had to worry about it. And what they do learn then, they learn more effectively, yeah. I think, so. When you're pushing sort of the, the boundaries in terms of approaches in the field and mm -hmm. how pedagogy is maybe traditionally done, did you meet resistance at all from students, from your discipline, from from, from colleagues? Uh, a little what? bit. Yeah. Not a lot, no. no. Um, maybe in the early days in math. Um, but no, it wasn't really a problem. Mm -hmm. Partly because I had the great good fortune to win a teaching award <laughs> um, the same year I got mm. a tenure track yeah. position. And so up until then, people had thought, well, you know, she does things in these weird ways. Yeah. But it did seem to be effective. Yeah. And so um, I think I had opportunities. That opened up opportunities yeah. for me. Some of the more not radical exactly, yeah. but more out there things yeah. I've done. I've done later in my career right. too as well. I mean, I did stay in math for, you know, like 20 some years. Yeah. Um, and I taught all the traditional math courses. Um, the design and the teaching of new courses in mm -hmm. new ways came later, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But I, I think, yeah, I did kind of push boundaries in the way that I taught math mm -hmm. with a different approach, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, in the public discourse, an interest in math and, mm -hmm. and the development of mathematical yes. ability in students and that. Yes. And from, from your experience, what, 
what would you say are sort of foundational understandings in mathematics that, that kids need to develop as they come through the school system, as they come into the university system, as they move through that, that program? What, well, that's a difficult question, yeah. and I think there are, are a lot of different answers. Yeah. I did have the chance to develop a course here within liberal education that's yeah. called quantitative reasoning, yeah. and, and I came at it from a lib ed point of view that, right. that actually asked what you're asking me, sort yeah. of what do we want people to know about math? Yeah. To me, I think there's a couple of things. Again, it's not so much content as a particular way of thinking right. that I try to communicate. Yeah. So it's a way of thinking, yes, that works for numbers and quantities and measurements, but it also works on a much broader scale. Right. And so I emphasize um, asking questions, looking for patterns. Really, that's what math is. It's the search for patterns, I yeah. think. Um, and using logical reasoning, using evidence-based reasoning, learning to critique evidence. Mm -hmm. And when you view it in that broad framework, I think, um, it's possible to make it more accessible, perhaps. Yeah. You know, not everybody needs to know calculus, yeah. right? Or, yeah. well, I would argue everybody needs to know some basic statistics, but yeah. we do that in schools now from right. grade two on, I think. Yeah. So I do some of that in my classes, but more kind of critiquing um, all the stuff we see in the media, right? right. You, yeah. you, can't, you can't be a good consumer, you can't be a good citizen, yeah. unless you know how to unpack all the data that's thrown at you by advertisers and politicians and media yeah. all the time, right? Yeah. We're constantly being told, you know, this is healthy for you or this study shows, yeah. you know, you need to understand the sort of basic underpinnings right. of those things and yeah. be able to ask the right questions, yeah. right? One of the things I do in my course besides that is a two-week module on savings and loans uh, and what to ask when you go to the bank yeah, for a mortgage. Yeah. And most of the students almost unanimously say at the end of the course, single most useful thing I learned in university. Why doesn't somebody teach us this somewhere else, right? Yeah. Yeah, so some practical stuff yeah. as well, right? Yeah. That's gonna help you in, in your real life. And, yeah. yeah. So math is a social practice. Not, yes, math know. is a social practice. Math for, for being a grown-up in the yeah. world. I mean, you need to know about budgets and loans yeah. and credit card interest. Math for citizenship, right? Yeah. Math for um, being able to think for yourself and not yeah. be... I, to me, one of the biggest problems is people are really intimidated by uh, numerical data, statistical yeah. data. Yeah. And it doesn't need to be that scary and intimidating. Yeah. And so many people, I think, back down because they think, oh, well, it's numerical. It must yeah. be right. And yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, and I want people to just learn to question. Yeah. Right? That's yeah. my motto now. Yeah. Question everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't believe what your profs tell you. Yeah. Don't believe what anybody tells yeah. you. Think for yourself. Yeah. And that's a very lit bad kind of yeah. approach yeah. to the world. Yeah. We have these debates and assessment around uses of percentages mm. around the same issue, right? Yes. But, we do yeah. a week on yeah. uses and abuses, yeah. especially abuses in the media of percentages, yeah. right? Yeah. And what the common errors are. Yeah. 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 And the implication of precision that mm -hmm. sometimes isn't it always yes. always correct, right? Right. It, and it how you can lie with graphical yeah. data and yeah. and that kind of thing. And right, yeah. we do a um, we do a unit on percentages that leads to compound interest, right. savings and loans, yeah. but then we also talk about exponential and linear growth models. Right. So we finish up with uh, world demographic information uh, and yeah, population yeah. models and yeah. environmental models and, yeah. you know, that gets into some really great kind of civic engagement sorts of yeah. questions too, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. You know, now I'm a teacher educator, so mm -hmm. I get to sit in the back of classrooms and watch young yes. teachers as they develop in that. And um, I always knew teaching was difficult. Mm -hmm. But then when you get to sit in the back of a classroom and watch someone learn yes. to teach, you realize yes. how much more difficult 
uh, yes. and complex this is. Yes. And what have you learned in your career about just what makes teaching difficult, what makes teaching well difficult, and, 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 and how have you worked through some of those difficulties? Well, it's an art as much as a science, yeah. way more than a science. And so I don't think there's any one set of rules, yeah. right? And that's what makes it so complex. Yeah. And every, every situation, every class is different. There's a different chemistry among the students, between the students and the professors. People often ask me, and I've had people come to my classes to watch, mm -hmm. you know, what is it you do? Mm -hmm. and, and I found it very hard to articulate that yeah. um, until recently. Uh -huh. And I'm not a, particularly a believer in, in tips and tricks. Yeah. What works for me in my classroom may not work at all for you. Yeah. A lot of it, I think, is, is personality driven. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I think there are some things that are important to me that I think could be helpful to others. Mm -hmm. One is reflection on teaching. I'm a great believer in, in metacognitive thinking right. for yeah. students about yeah. how to learn, but also for teachers to reflect on what they do and, and make notes on what they do and what they tried and why it worked and why it didn't. Um, I do a lot of that. I try to organize clearly. Mm -hmm. I've tried increasingly to um, figure out what is it I want students to know and be yeah. able to do beyond content. Yeah. You know, when I started, nobody wrote a teaching statement, teaching philosophy yeah, statement. Yeah, yeah. I didn't do one till, yeah. you know, I'd been teaching for 20 years. Yeah. And we didn't put on our course outlines anything about student objectives. Yeah. Our outlines in math used to be a quarter of a page. Yeah. This is our textbook. We'll cover the first six chapters. Yeah. You will learn it. That was the implied <laughs> goal. Um, but I've tried to do more about, okay, what do I really want them to come out of here understanding? Yeah. And, and I've been influenced by this sort of um, understanding by design right. where you work from that yeah. backwards. How will I know that they know that? Yeah. Um, that kind of planning. But also, I think, for me, it's a way of being in the classroom. Mm -hmm. I think that's a way of interacting with students mm -hmm. and treating them as partners in learning, mm -hmm. making it clear that I want them to learn, that I will help them to learn, um, that I care about them as individuals, mm -hmm. and I think Building that relationship of trust with students goes a long way, yeah. right? And I remember back in my early years of mm -hmm. teaching math, one of the comments from, from uh, a colleague who was doing the tutorials for my course that really pleased me and stuck in my mind was mm -hmm. that I could get them to do a huge amount of work mm -hmm. and they were willing to work for right. me, yeah. right? And that, to me, says something. You have to, you have to build that, that trusting relationship yeah. where they're willing to put in the effort. Mm -hmm. And in math, that often meant assuring them that if they put in the effort, they could be successful, because right. many of them hadn't been in the past. Yeah. It meant offering extra help and, um, and support for them. It meant seeing them as people. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, basic things. I go to class 10 minutes early. Mm -hmm. I get set up. I walk around. I go mm -hmm. and talk to the people in the back row and mm -hmm. make sure they can see and hear back there. Mm -hmm. I learn their names. Mm -hmm. That impresses them. Yeah. <laughs> I, one of the things I've done since the beginning is in every course in the first week, their first assignment for no marks is write me a letter of introduction. Please. Right? Yeah. And tell me about yourself, yeah. what you want me to know about you, yeah. what your math background is, if it's a math course, why you're taking the course, what you want to get out of it, yeah. anything you think I should know. And I would say about a quarter of them are the very short, generic, I'm this yeah. major taking these courses. Yeah. But many of them actually open up. Yeah. 
And I keep those letters and I go through them. And so yeah. every week I give back the homework, I learn yeah. a few more names, yeah. I read them. And then I can say to the student, yeah. oh, you're the one who wrote about. Wow. Or they will come up and say to yeah. me, well, I'm the one who wrote about yeah. growing up on a farm. Yeah. Oh, I know you. Yeah. And it builds that rapport, right, yeah. that you see them as people. Yeah. And I think that for me that goes a long way to building a trust yeah. and a good, a good working foundation for learning, yeah. right? Um, you have to balance that um, with establishing authority in right. the classroom, and yeah. that's often an issue. Less so for me as I'm older, yeah. but when I was young and, you know, small and friendly and yeah. smiled a lot at yeah. students, people would warn me that, yeah. you know, students will take advantage. And there's an element of that, but not as much as not anything to worry about. Yeah. And I know, we know when they're, you know, trying to yeah. get a break from <laughs> us. But I'm also flexible, yeah. and uh, and I make it clear that I want to help them succeed. Yeah. And and so I don't do anything fancy in the classroom. Yeah. I hate PowerPoint. Yeah. I very rarely use slides. Yeah. I'm a read-write kind of learner. The way yeah. I process ideas is by talking and writing. Yeah. So I write things on the board. And I tell them, if you write down what I write on the board, you will have a good set of notes, yeah. right? And, yeah. But standing up there and hitting a button, to me, is so yeah. incredibly boring. And if I'm bored, they're bored, yeah. right? Yeah. So I pace it by writing things out on the board. Yeah. I'll stop and talk about an idea and introduce it and draw some pictures yeah. and then, okay, now we have the idea, let's sum it up for your notes and yeah. write, you know, a, a summary of what went on yeah. so that all the essentials are there. Yeah. I don't know, I, I'm not glitzy or glamorous, I just go <laughs> in and do it and, yeah, um, yeah. it seems yeah. to work, I don't yeah. know. I don't have any secrets. No. <laughs> no secrets. <laughs> I get that ethic. I don't. I don't lecture, not because I think lecturing is terrible, but mm. I was always bored in lectures. And yeah. That, so I've had a much yes. different approach in my own. Yeah. For the same reason, I thought if mm. I'm bored. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And yeah. 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 So I mean, I do still lecture in math courses, yeah. but I try to break it up with, um, with conversation and with yeah. group work um, more and more. Um, you know, give them an exercise mm -hmm. to do. I mean, a lot of math is about practicing, right? Yeah. And I tell the students, you know, if an instructor's really good and kind of funny and entertaining yeah. and clear, in a way, that's a bad thing. Because yeah. you can sit here and think, you know, oh, I understand that, that makes perfect sense, but yeah. when you go home and work on it, yeah, yeah. that's when the real learning is, yeah. and you're not going to remember. Yeah. So, you know, this is what you have to do to, yeah. to work on things, yeah. right? You had said earlier that um, as you've gone further into your career, you've, you've done more, more radical kinds mm -hmm. of teaching. Mm -hmm. So what is some of that more radical type of teaching? What does it look like, and, and what, what drove you to those things? Well... Radical isn't quite the right <laughs> word, um, but but more, well, new things for mm -hmm. me, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not to say other people haven't done them. Mm -hmm. um, when I moved to the liberal education program to teach there, um, I got to teach this quantitative reasoning yeah. course. That is a math course, but it's called a liberal education course. Mm -hmm. And I think it was the first time I ever had a math course that didn't have a very defined content I had to get through mm -hmm. in order for students to go on to the follow-up course. Yeah. So I could do whatever I wanted, in a sense, whatever I thought was important. And if something wasn't going well, I could take the time to say, let's have another stab at that. Mm -hmm. um, I could detour into something that was interesting, those mm -hmm. kinds of things, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a lot more flexibility. Yeah. Um, I also teach Lib Ed 1000, or co-teach it, mm -hmm. and that's been really exciting for mm -hmm. me. So I do the liberal education intro now and the science parts of the course. Right. So um, I get to talk about science in a much broader sense than right. just math. Yeah. Um, that's been exciting. But really the, the biggest thing I would say was that I got to develop 
and design and teach my dream course, yeah. which is a course called Problems and Puzzles. Yeah. And um, I sort of got free reign, actually it was part of the board teaching chair yeah. thing, yeah. to propose this course and teach it. It's the most exciting teaching I've yeah. ever done. And it brought together so many of those basic ideas that had been there in my teaching, right. but allowed me to do it in a totally unique way. So it's intended to be a problem-solving course, and um, it sort of goes by various names. The official title is Problems and Puzzles. Yeah. I often refer to it as the Puzzles course or yeah. the Problem-Solving course. And about three years in, I realized really it's a course in metacognitive thinking mm -hmm. and problem solving. Yeah. But it brings all of those things together and it, it pushed the boundary for me um, of that process versus content right. balance yeah. because there is literally no content in yeah. the course, right? Yeah. You could think, well, how do you have a university level course with no content? Yeah. But the point was to focus on the metacognitive process yeah. entirely. And I did that for a couple of reasons. When I started uh, working on the course, I realized, I mean, there's a whole area out there called problem-based yeah. learning, and, and that wasn't quite what I had in mind. Mm -hmm. And when I looked for problem-solving courses, they were all very content-specific. Mm -hmm. There was problem-solving in engineering. Mm -hmm. Um, there was problem solving in business, mm -hmm. case studies mm -hmm. in business. Uh, a lot of the problem-based learning grew out of medical mm -hmm. training, mm -hmm. right? Um, but that was not the kind of thing I wanted. And for a lib ed course, what I planned for and what I get, in fact, I have 40 students in the course. Mm -hmm. They come from five different faculties and 30 different majors, right? Yeah. So. I couldn't assume any specific content. Yeah. I wanted it to be available to anybody yeah. um, who wanted to practice problem solving. And so I chose puzzles. I don't even think of them as the content, but as the vehicle for the thinking, yeah. right? And so the course is built around um, a series of about 10 themes, mm -hmm. uh, roughly one a week, 10 or 12 themes. Um, and I will lecture, uh, I realized the first week in that if I lecture, they get bored. Mm -hmm. If I give them a puzzle, they will work for hours, <laughs> literally. I have to kick them out after class some days. So I will introduce the week's theme on mm -hmm. Monday for 10 or 15 minutes. I will give them some puzzles, maybe do another short lecture for 10 minutes on yeah. Wednesday, more puzzles, and then Friday's our fun day where mm -hmm. we have a, a big puzzle that's gonna take yeah. them the entire class. Yeah. For the first few weeks, they just think, wow, this is fun and yeah. really easy and, you know, yeah. not a lot of work. And they do eventually start to realize that there's a lot of deep learning going on. Mm. So in addition to the puzzles and the themes, um, they do weekly assignments with more puzzles to practice the ideas, but they also do weekly metacognitive reflections. Right. Yeah. And these are guided usually with a topic. Mm -hmm. um, and we spend a lot of time in class on what I call debriefing. Right. So they'll have anywhere from 20 to 50 minutes to work on a problem. Mm -hmm. And either at the end of class or at the start of the next class, then we talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I specifically try to pick puzzles that have multiple ways of solving them, mm -hmm. um, that can be open-ended, that have extensions of the problem. Mm -hmm. And so we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. And it won't be me saying, this is the answer. It will be, how did you guys solve this problem? Yeah, yeah. And people will come up to the board once they get yeah. comfortable. Well, we did it this way. Yeah. And you know, I worked with my buddy and we came up with this. Yeah. And one of the amazing things for them to see, especially the ed students, yeah. is different people look at it totally yeah, yeah, yeah. differently, right? Yeah. And the breadth of solutions blows their minds, yeah. blows my mind. Yeah. Things that I thought there was one obvious mathematical way, you know, I knew how to yeah. do it because I was trained to do it that way. Yeah. And they will come up, every year somebody comes up with new ways yeah. to solve the same problem that yeah. I thought I knew all the answers yeah. for. 
Um, so we talk about that. We talk about what strategies did we use. We keep a kind of running list yeah. that we build up as we uh, go along. So what strategies? Where did you get stuck on the problem? Yeah. What was your breakthrough moment? Yeah. What hints? You know, or if somebody finishes the puzzle early, right? Yeah. I'll ask them, well, these guys are stuck. Can you think of a hint yeah. that won't give it away but yeah. might nudge them, right? Yeah. So we talk about all those aspects yeah. of the process, and then they have to write about that yeah. as well. Yeah. And that's where the learning is, right? And yeah. um, But it's, it's that old spoonful of sugar thing yeah. that they are having such a good time with the puzzles. Yeah. And one of the things I love about it is, I have this enormous collection of puzzles now, yeah. but the students take them home. Yeah. And they will come in and tell me, um, so I took this home for reading week, and my grandmother worked on them, and she wants to know how to do this one, and I didn't know. <laughs> or, you know, my roommates and I spend all of Friday night oh, working yeah. on this puzzle. Yeah. Or they'll email me. I give yeah. out the assignment at noon on Friday, yeah. and by 2 o'clock I'll get an email yeah. asking, can I have a hint for this one? Yeah. Um, sometimes they use it to stall on their other homework. Right, yeah. but. Um, I've had people come up to me in the hallway in the yeah. sixth level and say, I'm not in your class, but my roommate is, and <laughs> we wanted to know about, you know, so I feel like I'm sending my yeah. tentacles yeah. out into the community um, and reaching a lot of people. Yeah. And, and that kind of engagement yeah. to me is um, the essence, yeah. right? Yeah. You kind of hinted at this earlier, but I'm, I'm curious. Um, someone might say a university course on puzzles mm -hmm. and puzzling, you know, mm -hmm. really where's the value in that? And what, yeah. what are you seeing in terms of the value? What, what is it doing for your students? What are they Well, what are they that's one of this? the things we yeah. ask them to reflect on. Yeah. Um, um, we've done a, a number of research papers around yeah. this course. We've collected data from students. Yeah. And one of the things that we specifically ask them in the reflection assignment at the end of the class is, Okay, you've had a lot of fun playing with puzzles. Yeah. Is there anything, you know, yeah. beyond entertainment that you're getting out of this? What do you see? And it amazed me the first time we asked that, the kinds of answers we got. Yeah. Um, one student who's very politically active said, the week we did logical reasoning mm -hmm. allowed me to win a debate with a politician. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's that. Uh, we get majors in things like English and history, and they yeah. talk about um, doing better in their essays, right. that they've learned how to read texts and analyze texts better, yeah. that they find that they are better at putting together arguments in their essays, because yeah. we do spend a week or two on logical reasoning and yeah. logic puzzles. Um, so that kind of thing. Um, they learn time management skills. They've talked about being way more organized in their classes. Yeah. I've had students say, you know, I hadn't really thought about it, but I'm doing better this semester in all my classes, mm -hmm. and I think it's because of this. Yeah. So there's those practical kinds of skills, but they also identify what I think are meta-level skills or metacognitive skills, mm -hmm. and some of those are really important. The one that I think is the strongest is that they learn that making a mistake is mm -hmm. not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And it's really hit me in the last two years. Maybe people in the Faculty mm -hmm. of Education already know this, mm -hmm. but our whole school system is geared to make students, especially university-bound students, mm -hmm. scared of failing. Yeah. You don't want to get an X, you don't want to get an F, right? Mm -hmm. And so all their effort when they come to office hours goes towards, am I doing this right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they want to be constantly reassured. Mm -hmm. And one of the things this course does in the classroom situation is it creates a safe space. Mm -hmm. Takes them a couple of weeks to get comfortable, yeah. to have a safe space to make mistakes and realize mm -hmm. that you learn more from a mistake than mm -hmm. from getting the answer right immediately, yeah. right? Yeah. And that is actually really amazing for mm -hmm. them to mm -hmm. figure out. Yeah. 
I think we're failing them that we haven't taught them yeah. this before. Yeah. But to learn to relax and say, oh, I tried this and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And not then say, okay, I must be really stupid mm -hmm. or I'm not good at this, I was never good at math. Yeah. But to say, but I can go beyond that. Why didn't mm -hmm. it work? Oh, yeah. well, because I neglected to factor in this important bit of information. Yeah. Maybe yeah. if I go back, and sometimes it'll take two or three iterations, but to get comfortable mm -hmm. with that process of failing and analyzing why and trying again, mm -hmm. that's a huge hurdle. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a really significant thing. Yeah. So they pick up on that. They pick up on persistence. So by two thirds of the way mm -hmm. through, um, <laughs> they start to joke with me that the P and P for problems and puzzles is really patience and persistence. Uh, yeah. And so when I ask them, what did you learn? Yeah. That's what they learn, sure. patience and persistence. Mm -hmm. To not give up the mm -hmm. minute something isn't going mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. or you know, if you don't know where to start. Yeah. And you see that then in things like essay writing. Yeah. I don't have an idea, I don't know where to start, yeah. and I'm scared, I don't want to do it wrong, so I won't do anything until the night before when it's a panic situation and yeah. I can whip something off and never think about it yeah. again. Right? They yeah. learn to tackle things slowly and patiently yeah. in an iterative kind of way. I'll just try something. It may not work, but it'll teach me something if it doesn't. Yeah. And that, those are really important life skills, yeah. right? Yeah. Academic and otherwise. Yeah. And, and the students, in fact, do see, um, they've written really interesting examples for me of um, reorganizing things at work, yeah. starting their own company, yeah. organizing things at home, planning events, yeah. where they see those kinds of skills being useful, right? So. Um, not only in their other courses academically, but in the broader yeah. scheme of things. Yeah. Yeah. It strikes me as I've been listening um, to you over the last little while, you, you talk about risk taking with the mm -hmm. students and that, but it strikes me that as you've moved through your career, there's been an enormous amount oh, of risk yes. taking on your part. And well, this course, yeah. this, you know, before that, a little bit, yeah. um, willing to try new things, yeah. I think, because I found, um, I mean, math courses are pretty cut and dried, yeah. the sort of mainstream ones. When we talk about modern algebra, that's mm -hmm. 1840. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you do a course once, you figure out how you're going to organize it yeah. and how to illustrate things with examples, mm -hmm. but you don't have to throw it out and start over every yeah, three years yeah, yeah. like in computer science where yeah, the technology's yeah. moved on. Yeah. So I found I did get bored. Right. And so my new rule is every fourth year. Yeah. It takes me three years to get a course. Yeah. The first time is total chaos and you're yeah. barely a week ahead of the students yeah. if you're lucky. And the second time you know you have a kind of outline but a lo half of it has to be fixed and the yeah. third time it's getting comfortable yeah. and then it's time for a new project for me. Yeah. But this particular course, the problems and puzzles, yes, it was, yeah. a, it was an enormous risk. Yeah. I'm not a good problem solver, yeah. at least I didn't used to be. <laughs> I would say now that I am, but I didn't used to be. Yeah. I was never the kind of person who liked those mathy logic puzzles and yeah. games and things. There's still a lot that I can't do. Um, and the kind of teaching it involved was enormously scary mm -hmm. because it was so nonlinear. Right. And I was used to complete control in the classroom. Yeah, when yeah. you teach math, and half the students at least are terrified of the subject, yeah. you have complete control, yeah. right? <laughs> it's linear, you know what you have yeah. to do. Right, so I would go in and um, the first few weeks and I would have a puzzle and I would have no sense whatsoever of how long it was gonna take. Mm -hmm. I had students from 30 different majors. I had no idea if it was gonna be easy for them or hard mm -hmm. for them. Often what I predicted was exactly wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, I couldn't tell, is it going to take 20 minutes or is it going to take 50 minutes? So I would have three different lesson plans mm -hmm. and backup plans. Mm -hmm. 
I soon discovered that actually it was worse than that. Half of them would be done in 20 minutes mm -hmm. and half would be done in 50 minutes. Mm -hmm. So I had to have, you know, scaffolding. Okay, yeah. you guys finished early. Why don't you work on this harder version yeah. of the same problem? Yeah. Or go and work with other people or, yeah. you know. So there was no control. Yeah. And I'm a control freak. Yeah. I'm a type A perfectionist. Yeah. I wanted it all, you know, my first year of teaching, I wrote yeah. down every single word I was going to say in the classroom. Right? Yeah. Okay, I've come a long way from that. Yeah. So I would go in with a puzzle and be able to wing it. Yeah. And it scared me. Yeah. But I also realized fairly early on, even that first semester, and looking back, it wasn't a great course at all. Yeah. It was really a work in progress compared to now. But still, um, about the yeah. first month, there was a, a day when they were all still working at the end of class, and they yeah. didn't leave. Yeah. They stayed. I had to kick them out when the next <laughs> class was desperate to yeah. get in. Yeah. And I thought, OK, this is working. I yeah. should relax a bit. Yeah. And, um, and yeah. now I love it. And yeah. I have a repertoire of problems, and I kind of can estimate how things are going to go. And, yeah. But even so, um, sometimes for me, a high point was there was one occasion when I took in a puzzle I didn't know the answer to. Mm. I knew that I had known it 20 years ago mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when somebody showed it to me, but yeah. I couldn't remember. And I thought, well, we'll just see where this goes. And yeah. sure enough, somebody solved it and yeah. explained it to the class, and now I know how to do it. Yeah, yeah. And I've become very comfortable with right. that. And again, yeah. very open with the students yeah. that I'm not an expert. Yeah. And if I can figure out these things, you can. And um, I welcome you guys to bring mm -hmm. in. They'll bring in puzzles and things that they've come mm -hmm. across to share. And that I'm as much a student as they are. Mm -hmm. and, and that's been true with the research project. Mm -hmm. um, I learn as much from them as yeah. they learn from me. And, and that also helps create a, an atmosphere of learning. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. It strikes me that trust is an important yes, part of the whole puzzle. Very much, in that, yes. And, you know, in different ways. Trust, yes. Your own trust for yourself and your yes. ideas. Yes. Your trust of your students. Yes. Your students' trust of you. I suspect mm -hmm. your trust of the institution. In a yes. Sense, you know. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That I, you know, I'm allowed. To, they let me do this, yeah. right? And yeah. I mean, that was an amazing gift to be able to yeah. do this. And I couldn't have done it. 30 years ago, no, yeah. I wouldn't have taken those kinds of risks yeah. um, on all those levels, right? Yeah. So, yeah. My sense is, in, in my own research with teachers in the school system, and that, uh, I see this as well, that fear seems to limit mm -hmm. a lot of our potential as, yes. as educators in that. And how have you learned how to manage and deal with and push through kind of the fears that might have limited you otherwise? Well, I think there are different levels of fear mm -hmm. we could talk about. There's, so there's personal um, anxiety, mm -hmm. and I was quite nervous in my early days of teaching. I'm, um, I used to think I was a shy person. Mm -hmm. I'm not so much shy as an introvert. Mm -hmm. And so it took a lot of energy for me to go in and, and be on in yeah. classrooms, especially big classrooms, yeah. right? Um, so there was that level of anxiety, mm -hmm. just teaching, that I think many of us have. Yeah. Um, there's a level of, of risk taking, of trying new things. Yeah. And there's also, I think, um, the sort of career risks yeah. that are still there. Yeah. So I, I guess I could talk about all three of those if yeah. you want. On a personal level, it comes with experience yeah. that you get more comfortable in the classroom. and. Yeah. But I still um, occasionally feel nervous, yeah. but I make a point of keeping things very conversational. Even right. when I'm lecturing, yeah. I'm looking at different people, I'm talking to different people, and I try to treat it as a conversation with a couple of people, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. make it kind of low-key and friendly and approachable yeah. like that. So that helps, I think, with both my own um, style and anxiety and yeah. also with building trust with students. Yeah. Um, the taking risks came with age and confidence mm -hmm. and support and also I think uh, for me at least a different career level. Yeah. 
Right. And so this is something that is an issue for mm -hmm. a lot of younger faculty mm -hmm. especially, right? Um, how do you balance getting tenure, yeah. getting promoted to full professor if yeah. you want to to aim for that yeah. um, with investing a lot in teaching and yeah. possibly taking risks. And for me, um, a lot of the more innovative stuff I've done came after I got promoted yeah. to full professor, right? Yeah. And so um, uh, I had a, a kind of safety net in right. a different way. Yeah. Um, and I have to say, I really admire many of our more junior colleagues mm -hmm. now who are getting involved with the teaching center. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're one of yeah. them, right? <laughs> Being board chair, the teaching yeah. fellows, but also just many people who are doing really innovative things in their classroom. And that takes a certain amount of bravery yeah. in the sense, I mean, in the personal senses, but also because it takes away time and energy from research, yeah. which has always traditionally been the primary me measure on which we're yeah. graded for yeah. promotion, right? Um, and so for me, it's been easier to do things in the last, well, 15 years, 10 right. years even. Yeah. Um, partly because I've reached a point where I have proved myself yeah. as much as I need to prove myself to mm -hmm. anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, teaching awards help yeah. because they give you that kind of credibility. Yeah. So, you know, that lends, leads to opportunities mm -hmm. to do things. Um, and some of it is just, you know, you get old enough, you've got nothing left to lose, <laughs> you're willing to say, you know. Um, I'll, I want to do this and yeah. I will do it yeah. and so it's a kind of combination right. of things of career stage of of shifts in the institution mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. I think there's a lot more support right. for teaching now the teaching center has been absolutely fundamental in mm -hmm. that right mm -hmm. that when it's been what 10 years now yeah, since it years. started yeah. um, and that has given a kind of um, sense of community of teachers yeah. and support for teaching um, that lets people do innovative things, the fellows program, the board mm -hmm. chairs program, mm -hmm. um, that gives people a bit of release time mm -hmm. and opportunities then to do a new project mm -hmm. um, that isn't on top of what they're already doing in their teaching. That yeah. makes a huge difference, right? Yeah. 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 So I think we're in a very different place than we were when I was starting, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Part of the the, um, the criteria for the 3M award, mm -hmm. I mean, it's Canada's most prestigious teaching award. Yes. It also looks at leadership yes. in, in teaching. Yes. And, and we've got a few minutes left, but could you talk maybe about some of the work you've done in sort of leadership and teaching at the institution? Ah, oh, yes. Um, well, I've been involved in various groups, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I was on the committee that spent a year leading up to the teaching center mm -hmm. being founded. CATL, it was called mm -hmm. in those days. And then as the inaugural board chair, I was chair of the mm -hmm. advisory council mm -hmm. for two years. So I was part of that group. I certainly wasn't the only one mm -hmm. or the main one, mm -hmm. but part of a group of really dedicated, caring people who set a lot of that in motion, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, the talking about teaching was right. one that I'm proud of that yeah. I started because before then we did have some formal talks, yeah. but I wanted people to have, I'm, I'm, I'm all about conversation. I yeah. wanted people to be able to just get together and talk about teaching. Mm -hmm. So that's what we called it. Mm -hmm. um, so there was that. Um, I got to start some of the quantitative um, courses within the LIBED program mm -hmm. on a different but in my mind related note I founded the Women Scholars Group mm -hmm. and got funding for that that was a um, we got funding for a speaker series mm -hmm. that was back in 2002 mm -hmm. to try to improve um, the community feel for women. Mm -hmm. Up until then, there weren't that many women hired. We'd had a wave that wasn't all that successful and mm -hmm. people left. Mm -hmm. And so this was a way to 
when women were coming into departments that didn't have any other women right. to build a community for yeah. them, yeah. to give them chances to talk about their work, but also to meet people interested in their work. Mm -hmm. I'm still the list moderator for that. Yeah. I've been involved in the last two years. I've been the coordinator of the Arts and Science Global Citizenship Cohort, right. been teaching in that. And I guess for me, the really big thing in the last three years has been working with the liberal education mm -hmm. revitalization team. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, that's been an amazing experience for me, not least because it's brought together administrative work with mm -hmm. research work, with mm -hmm. teaching work, mm -hmm. right? And so um, it's an administrative role that I took on chairing that, mm -hmm. but it was all about our philosophy of teaching and learning at mm -hmm. the U of L. Mm -hmm. And so it tied together all my interests. Mm -hmm. And I think we've actually, we've had a fabulous team and we've done some amazing work. As you probably know, it's yeah. culminated in the formation of a school of liberal education, right. effective yeah. this July. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge shift administratively mm -hmm. within the university, rather than being a small program in mm -hmm. arts and science, we will now be able to really extend our reach across the university. Mm -hmm. um, we've been doing that in the last few years, but this makes it official and mm -hmm. gives us kind of the authority to reach out across the university. Yeah. So a lot of those strands of my teaching um, and research have come together, I think, in that in that mm -hmm. project. So those were the kinds of leadership things that were highlighted in the yeah. dossier. And how has your, your leadership affected your teaching? Or how has your teaching affected your leadership? Probably the teaching has affected the leadership more mm -hmm. in some ways because um, it has been, I mean, the committee work that I've taken on and, and taken leadership roles in, as I said, has mm -hmm. revolved around the basic philosophy of teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. And so that's where my heart is. And yeah. I've always thought of myself and described myself as a front end, mm -hmm. a front line teacher, mm. because there was a stage when, you know, you'd get asked to be on this committee or that committee. and. I, I got to a point where I didn't want to be on another committee to yeah. talk for a year about mm -hmm. teaching. I wanted to teach. Yeah, yeah. And so instead of, I would take that time that would have been devoted to being on a two-year term on a committee, and I would say, I want to design and teach right. a new course. Let yeah, me yeah. do that instead. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I even did it on overload a few times, yeah. right? Um, I'm a front lines person. I want to be mm -hmm. in the classroom with the students. and I've tried to never lose sight of that yeah. and that's where I get my energy from yeah. and so especially the last 10 years I've had the luxury of being able to pick and choose projects a little bit more yeah. and I've picked things that don't replace being in the classroom mm -hmm. but connect with it yeah. I think yeah. in ways that I really care about yeah. and have been able to have an influence on right, right? like spreading more influence of liberal education mm -hmm. to people's teaching all across yeah. campus yeah. to talk about critical thinking and metacognitive learning and yeah. evidence-based reasoning. Those are the things I care about for teaching and that's yeah. what liberal education is about. So yeah. that's where my heart is. Yeah. yeah, well fabulous. I think we're at the end of our hour. It's okay. been a real it pleasure to talk with you. Yeah. And uh, well, thank uh, you. again, congratulations. Thank uh, you, it's been my pleasure to chat yeah. with you. We're very fortunate to have you Thanks. <laughs> at the university. Thank yeah. you.